from Microbe TV. This is Tuivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 12, recorded on September 28th, 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo a family of safe, expandable, yet simple-to-use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today, right here in New York City, Nels Eldy. Hey, great to be in the neighborhood. Thanks for having me you just over. were here and you popped in, right? That's right, yeah. <laughs> Open door policy here in the, the engine room of TWIV and TWIM and TWIP and I like Twivo. that, the engine room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is your second visit to the TWIV studio. Yeah, great to be back in vivo. Last was, time you were at Cold Spring Harbor, right? Correct, yeah. There was the biology of genome meetings. And then uh, I came back to give a seminar this time in the uh, Department of Biological Sciences. right. So that happened Monday, and then I've just been enjoying New York City for the last day or two. So some listeners may know that um, Stuart Firestein is a member of that department, and we've had him on TWIV twice. I don't think there's anyone else from that department we've had on. Uh, well, we did cover uh, Molly Przorski's work. That's right. Yep. Is she in biological sciences? She is, and yeah. Did you yeah, meet yeah. up with her? I did, yep. She was my host, and so it was great to catch did, up with did her. Did you tell her we helped make her more famous? That's right. I should have. Now, I'll, I'll go back. I'll go back. To get the Tuivo bump. There you go. Well, uh, we do have someone here in studio yeah. who is, in fact, from Columbia University. He's in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and Environmental Biology. Josh Drew, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's really exciting, and it's an honor to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. We were um, last time you were here. We were looking for someone local mm -hmm. to bring up. We found you. I don't remember how. How did we find Josh? Seminar uh, notice. How or can something? you? How can you miss him? The man. <laughs> yeah, he's all over the place. Yeah, we found you. You couldn't make it last time, and then when I heard that Nels was going to be back, I said, "Let me try again." The funny thing is, is that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he's never been to this campus. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> nope, I've never made it up on the one line to to the stop, but uh, I'm very glad to be able to come here today, and uh, this is going to be a really fun opportunity just to chat for a Yeah, we, so we talk all about you and your work, your what you teach, and anything else that comes to mind. You came in with a Yankee hat. Huh? You, I guess you're a Yankee fan. I am. I was debating whether to go to the game tonight or not. I think it's a, a lost cause for the, making the playoffs, <laughs> but uh, a night spent watching baseball is not a bad night. So a little over a week ago, I was at a meeting in Boston. The meeting started on, uh, I think, Sunday. So I, I went in Saturday night, and I stayed right behind Fenway Park, and little did I know there was a Yankees game that night. Can you imagine? Those are intense. I did my <laughs> PhD work at BU, which is Kitty Corner from... Oh, no, um, that's where the meeting was. Yeah, yeah. So, so we used to be able to see that... Um, that morass of people coming in and oh, I, man. those days not to wear my Yankees So the, I was at the Commonwealth Hotel. <laughs> okay, Probably yeah. I know where that is, right? And they were selling game programs right in front of the hotel because it's a, oh, just yeah. right behind Fenway. So when I was a postdoc in Boston, I, so this was in the Reggie Jackson era. Nice. I went to a game or two. I sat out in the bleachers and I remember one time he hit a home run <laughs> to the bleachers, but there are lots of Yankee fans out there. Oh, yeah. It was a long time ago. Things now, are heating up. September baseball. I don't follow baseball anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't have time, unfortunately, but I uh, used to when I was a kid. So, uh, Josh, you uh, have been, you said you're at Columbia about five years. Let's start at the very, very beginning. Uh, where are you from originally? I grew up in upstate New York in Albany. Ah, not too far from here. Oh, you, know where that, you know where that is, Nels. Yeah, not too far. <laughs> <laughs> Almost uh, accidentally got on the bus to Albany. I was trying to get on the High Line to just walk over there and uh, mm -hmm. uh, almost accidentally made it up to your uh, 
home territory. I think that's about 48% of all people end up in Albany do there by mistake. So. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, you got a high school there as well? Uh, just outside in the suburbs there. Okay. Um, and where'd you go to college? I went to undergrad, ironically enough, at Drew University. Ah. In New Jersey? Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's, uh, listen, um, I have three kids in college now, so two of them are freshmen. So we were visiting last year, and we went to Drew. My younger son mm-hmm. was interested. And um, Bill Campbell had just won the Nobel Prize right. for discovering ivermectin, right? And he was an adjunct of some kind. He he was at Merck most of his career, but he had an adjunct appointment at Drew. And they had all these signs all over campus. Congratulations to our uh, Professor yeah. uh, Campbell. She's probably ignored normally, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and this kind of gets something we may talk about later about the the importance of, of mentoring, giving research experience yeah, to undergrads. Yeah. Um, Drew does a good job of taking uh, researchers who are in industry and, and essentially giving them kind of like an REU program, mm-hmm. but it's a, a self-funded one. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I was pretty excited um, for Drew to be able to do that and just the, the educational opportunities that I got there. What did you major in there? Uh, biology with a minor in anthropology. Mm-hmm. So growing up, were you always interested in science? or? Yeah, you know, it was one from? of those things. Um, I grew up um, loving going hiking, going out in the woods, and, yeah. and then I realized that if I studied ecology, I could get college credit for doing that, and mm-hmm. it sort of fell through that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but as a kid, you know, there's the New York State Museum in Albany, and um, I would go there. I don't know. I feel like two or three weekends out of the out of the month. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my parents are pretty sick of it by the time I got done. But um, <laughs> you know, I also work um, with the American Museum of Natural History here in New York, and yeah. it's my parents both find that pretty funny that you know, as a kid, yeah. they couldn't drag me out of the museum, and now I'm still <laughs> still in there uh, fairly frequently as well. Yeah. You know, uh, now as I started reading Sean Carroll's book, oh sure. Mm-hmm. The Evo Devo Revolution. I, th- I forgot the exact name, but it was recommended last yep. episode. Do you yep. know this, this yeah. uh, book? Yeah. And in the first chapter, he starts talking about, you know, the, most kids that like for science comes from just looking in the natural world, you know, mm-hmm. being outside, being amazed with animals. And he said he went to a school and the two most drawn animals were zebras and butterflies, <laughs> you know. And so it just comes from growing up in a world that's natural, right? That's right. Yeah, I mean, that's E.O. Wilson's biophilia hypothesis, uh-huh. right? That we have this ingrown <laughs> affinity for nature. Um, yeah. And I was lucky enough to uh, to grow up in an area where there was, you know, backwoods, and my grandma was a uh, elementary school teacher. So when she was off in the summers, I was off in the summers, we would spend afternoons just kind of tromping around in the back. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's just sort of... Uh, it, it primed me so that when I was able to go to college and start learning about ecology and evolution, I kind of knew the substrate upon which those theories were going to be laid. And uh, I remember one of my seminal experiences at Drew is Drew is very big on doing um, experiential learning. So we would do these January courses and mm-hmm. I did one in Mexico. And um, I remember the first time I went scuba diving was there and I had this sort of um, epiphany moment where I was, it's like hiking, but it's even cooler because it's coral reefs underwater. <laughs> and I got buzzed by a sea turtle on my oh, first wow. dive ever. And I was like, <laughs> what? This is, you can get, this is a vocation. And, and mm. I was sort of hooked there. Um, but it's funny because the, one of the, I almost went into ornithology because birds are fascinating and mm. there's you know great systems for ecology and evolution to study. But the, the ornithology class started at eight and as a junior, I was just not, <laughs> not having an 8 a.m. class. So. The career defined by the hour, right? There you go. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, yeah. turning points. Those are, these you things should, matter. We did a cool Twivo on pigeon feet yep. feathering. Yeah, my colleague, Mike Shapiro at Very Utah, cool. who's been doing a lot of the morphological basis, uh, genetic basis of morphology differences in pigeons. And yeah, you just keep scratching the surface of Amazing. bird diversity and then kind of all the way down, there's so much fascinating stuff going on. So I just read a report um, by my colleagues at the Field Museum where I did a postdoc mm-hmm. about the condition of pigeon feet in Chicago, mm. which you know may seems rather, rather obscure, but they were noting that um, a lot of pigeons in Chicago had lost toes and the part... The reason why they're hypothesizing was twofold. One, because it's Chicago and it's cold, right? So they, <laughs> they suffer from, from frostbite as well as, as mammals do. But the other thing was that um, they build their nests out of um, available substrate. And in the wild, 
this is softer material like hay and, and straw and things like that. Mm-hmm. But in the city, it's either human hair or, or polyester fiber, and that gets wound around their digits and essentially cuts off uh, the blood flow, and they're, they're losing toes that way. Yeah. Then the next question is, does natural selection see that in a sort of rapid way? And so we have mm-hmm. this idea of uh, wildlife adapting to urban settings in sort of a quick way. Who knows? Come back in a few hundred years, and maybe those pigeons will have more toes if there's a negative consequence to losing some of those digits. Yeah, and you know, some of the, the work... Um, <laughs> done by folks um, looking at the, the even the population genetics of, for instance, mice between Manhattan and the Bronx. It, mm-hmm. It's it's amazing how quickly mm-hmm. um, those populations are getting are getting subdivided. And you can start seeing that um, really fine scale population genetic structure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it didn't take long for the moths to respond, right? Yeah, we covered that uh, a couple of Twivos ago, quick. the spicing up a peppered moth, yeah. how fast you can select. I think in this case, on uh, the frequency of alleles in a population um, of course, that was the color coloration mm-hmm. patterns mm-hmm. of the, uh, the yep. carbon era one, exactly. wasn't it? If I remember correctly, Correct. yeah, that's right, Josh. Yeah, Makes me hungry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't think it actually was carbon era. That's the food. I forgot the uh, carbonaria or something like yeah, that. Yeah, carbonaria. Yeah, yep. but I just remembered the food. <laughs> anyway, continuing with your n- next, uh, you must have gone to graduate school. Did you go right after Drew? I did. I went to uh, to do my master's in biodiversity conservation and public policy at SUNY Albany, mm. um, where I was actually did most of my work down at the Museum of Natural History here in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did sort of an externship there looking at uh, marine reserves in the Bahamas. And upon graduation from that, I was actually able to join an expedition with AMNH, the Museum of Natural History, uh, to go to Andros Island in the Bahamas for about a month. And again, going back to those sort of moments that shape your career, that, that literally immersive type of research where we go out and the idea was to catalog the biodiversity of this reef for a month was just mm-hmm. fantastic. Um, diving two, three times a day and, and going out with experts from fish and, and different invertebrates and the plants and, and going through and just kind of doing a full scale biodiversity survey mm-hmm. was, was really f- amazing to be able to see the level of work that goes into it. And also to sort of set the, um, the expectations of what professional level biology is, because I think, um, you know, I hadn't had a lot of research experience before that. And so I wasn't quite sure at what level the game was played, so to speak. And they were, um, they were generous with me to kind of ease me into what that level of expectation is. But I think that's one of the things that early scientists sometimes um, have difficulty understanding as to the intensity of, of what graduate level work is like. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and that's one of the things that here at Columbia, I try to work a lot with undergrads to kind of give them a glimpse as to, kind of what to get ready for. Mm. Um, but it was amazing for the folks at the museum to take me out and to just do a month of diving in the Bahamas and, um, and working on everything from how fish move based on the, the different types of food available in their habitats to the distribution of uh, shrimp inside of giant sponges. And it was really just an amazing experience. So I guess a lot of that involves photography. Is that right? Uh, this was actually collections based. You so collect, we were collect, um, okay. we were going through and we were um, fixing most of the stuff in formalin and taking mm-hmm. it back and and building the collections. And, and that's really important because the museum used to have a field station out in the Bahamas in the 1920s, and they have a really extensive collection of what those reefs looked like back in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. here we were, 80 years later, after several severe environmental. Uh, perturbations to the system mm. and it was great to be able to to build those collections in 2000 and compare those to what the ones yeah, in the 1920s yeah. were like to see not only what species were there but also in terms of the evolutionary perspective you know uh, is there size selection from fishing you know, do we see a stand uh, an average smaller size in the newer ones and it's one of the great things about yeah. museum right. collections is being able to create these biodiversity time capsules you know just like you know, kind of going back to episode 10, looking at the pepper moths, you know, being able to go back and genotype the, the museum collections from the 1800s and be able to see what the, the range of gene expression was like then. Yeah. And, and remind me, so it seems like, um, I mean, I completely agree. And the, the idea of funding museum collections has recently been under a little bit of fire. And so um, at least I think as it uh, pertains to some of the NIH and NSF investments, has that sort of resolved at all, or is it still an open question? I mean, it's it's a, an ongoing question because they never go away. Yeah. You know, that's the whole point of museum collections is that you're mm-hmm. building it with the idea that 
those data will be available for centuries after. And with um, you know funding cycles clearly not working at that level, yeah. um, there's a, a fundamental disconnect between the level of funding available and the um, time frame over which that needs to be dispersed. And then that's coupled with this sort of a uh, common narrative of of this dusty museums like why do you need this mm-hmm. you know organism that was cut back 200 years ago what what use does that have i think we we have to push against that we in the museum community or collections based research community have to push against that and showing examples of when when those collections are used in modern day sure. research and yeah. really help establish a baseline you um, don't you often don't know it's just like the serendipity of fundamental research often we don't know what we're going to find. Here's an example uh, from the virus world. A new uh, retrovirus has been infecting koalas in Australia. So they went back to some museum pelts from the 1800s that have been stored, and they could extract DNA and show that, in fact, they were infected back then. And so that was an unanticipated benefit, right? You would never have thought in the 1800s that you could use this. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating. And, you know, with the, the genomic resources coming up, um, you know, with, with next-gen sequencing, looking at mm-hmm. much smaller base pair yeah. fragments, we're able to, to dive into some of that more archive stuff because we don't need to have four or 500 base pair fragments coming out to be useful. We can, yep. you yep. can stitch together, you know, 30, 40, 50 pieces together. And, and that's great because when we're able to get the genomic resources as well as the, the morphological one, it, it's, it's redoubling the benefit of those collections. All right. So then next step uh, after... Uh, Albany, that was a master's program, yep. right? What'd you do next? Well, um, this is kind of a, a, a funny and, and vaguely romantic story. I <laughs> I had applied to grad school and hadn't hadn't got in, and I was living with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, in in Ossining, so just a little bit north of here. And we had <laughs> sing sing <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we had slightly better accommodations, <clears throat> so. I had um, secured a non-paid research volunteership at the University of Tampa um, because I wanted to work with the professor and I needed some sort of, of foot in the door. And I was not particularly thrilled because I didn't have that much savings and I was going to move away from my family and live down in Florida for a year and apply for grad school. And, and this was suboptimal, but it seemed to be the best at the time. We had I had my car literally packed. We were going to go out for dinner on a Saturday night and I was going to leave that Monday. Um, so this was like our last goodbye. And my uh, now wife was in the shower and decided to check my email. And, and I, at that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sounds dangerous. <laughs> and um, In the shower or else when she got out? While she was in the shower, I was outside. <laughs> Keeping it clean. Folks. <laughs> um, and during that time, I had gotten an email from somebody at the Wildlife Conservation Society, the, the people who run the Bronx Zoo that they had gotten a grant and they specifically wanted somebody to look at marine reserves in the Caribbean, which is what I had done my um, my master's thesis on. And they wanted me to come in and interview for the job. And so I, I canceled my trip down. I interviewed and ended up getting the job as a research associate with the WCS, the Wildlife Conservation mm-hmm. Society, for uh, two and a half years. And that was great because you know, we still had our reservations and everything, but instead of this, like, I'll see you in six months, maybe we can see each other on the weekend yeah. sort of thing. It's like, wow, I just got a job, you know, 15 miles down the road. And, nice. um, yeah. And that was one of those, again, it's funny. You can come back to these seminal moments in your yeah, life. Sure, that was sure. really one of those, um, the, the path had forked and, and, uh, fortunate circumstances allowed me to stay and, and continue my career. And so I got this job as a research associate at WCS. Um, we were working with a field station that they had in Belize. Um, in particular, they were looking at um, the shark populations in this remote atoll about 23 miles offshore. And so my job was on the science side was to go and help um, figure out what these sharks were doing. So we would go down um, and work with a couple of researchers, a couple of graduate students, and we'd have this extensive tagging program. So we would go out and to Belize uh, every year for two or three weeks and basically long line for sharks. We would release them all, but we would mm-hmm. tag them. Um, and the graduate student was looking at the genetics and we were kind of handling the spatial ecology of it. And mm-hmm. it was a really great opportunity to be able to uh, see. For me, the most important part uh, was not the science, but to see how conservation biologists or people is sort of in the field use the data that we produce as scientists, right? Because I had just come out from purely an academic background. And here suddenly I was working for people who had their feet on the ground and, and it helped me understand the translation of a, a paper in a journal into 
actionable management recommendations. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really invaluable because a big part of what I do is, is trying to do science to inform management and moving forward with my career, having had that experience, it really helped me figure out how to produce my science in such a way that it was easily digestible so that people on the field could, could use it without having to go through a lot of rigmarole. So that was a non-degree position, right? Yeah, it was, it was just, just a, it was a, a job. research tech, yeah. Um, okay. And that lasted, um, ironically enough, until uh, the towers fell. And I didn't mm. realize at that point in time that WCS got a lot of money from the city of New York. And after September 11th, quite justifiably, the city of New York had to reallocate some of its expenses. Mm. And so um, my position became uh, became truncated. So I got laid off and um, I got married about uh, a year later. Um, so it was, you know, we survived, um, and I started my PhD program, uh, shortly after that. Where? Uh, I did it at the Boston University Marine Program, which okay. at the time was a field station sort of situation down in Woods Hole. So it was okay. a, it was co-run by the, the MBL, the Marine Biological Laboratory down there. Yeah, got it. Mm -hmm. huh. Woods Hole, interesting yeah, place. That, You've been to some Woods Hole meetings? Now? Yeah, yeah, nice nice spot to train and hang out. Oh, it's fantastic. And, you know, we did our wedding a little bit on the cheap. We were able to buy a house in East Falmouth, um, nice. which was nice because we didn't have to deal with, with the rents. And um, my wife's a high school math teacher and mm -hmm. had a job there. And so I had a little bit of stability and it was great. I mean, biking into work along the, yeah, the Atlantic sure. and um, just that, that intellectual community was amazing. Yeah, I remember I was interviewing and like most times you, I, I took myself out to go, to lunch after the interview. And you know, most times you sit in a cafe in the U S and people are talking about, I don't know, the view, or I guess at that point in time it was American idol or something like that, but some sort of like trivial matter. And, yep. and I overheard the people next to me trying to figure out the best way to get their equipment into Antarctica. And I was like, this is definitely the place for me. Like this is, this is nerddom. And, and I felt very, very comfortable. Very, it's a good thing. You know, I rarely hear scientific conversations in public, right? When you think about it, yeah, of course, just hear, like you say, a lot of trivia or business and stuff that's not really, not to offend any business people, but not of interest. Probably not listening. I, I never hear <laughs> anyone listening. saying, how are we going to get this PCR to work? That's <laughs> right. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. If anything, I mean, I've over, if you do overhear a conversation on a scientific topic, sometimes it's so wildly out of context or just not something that a scientist yeah, yeah. would sort of worry about that it's hard not to kind of st want to step in and, and correct the record. I was on a plane once reading a, a, an article in Cell and the guy next to me looked at it. He said, are you a scientist? And we started talking. He turned out to be Steve McKnight. Oh, there you a well go. Known, yeah. <laughs> a well-known scientist who I knew and admired very much. Oh, yeah, so we, yeah. we ended up talking the rest of the flight, but that's pretty rare. Yeah. What did you work on uh, for your PhD? I worked on um, trying to understand how populations of coral reef fish across the South Pacific were connected and specifically looking at what were the, um, the, the big areas of population divergence uh, identifying some endemic, endemic species and thinking about how we could use understanding how we could use information on their population genetic structure to come up with uh, management plans. Mm. So it was great. I spent most of my time in Fiji, and it's funny because people um, <laughs> tough. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I get that all the time. But it's funny you know, people hear you, you. You did work in Cape Cod, and, and yeah. I was actually never in Cape Cod during the summer. Uh -huh. um, the only summer I was in Cape Cod is when I took their workshop on molecular ecology. I see. Um, mm. And so I would, I would get out of Dodge when, when all the tourists yeah. come in and it would come sure, back and sure. sort of calm and everything. So maybe you could now tell us, you'd say I go to Fiji and I s try and figure out how the fish are connected across the Pacific. What do you actually do on a on a day-to-day -day basis? Tell us some of the techniques and, and so forth. Well, going out in the field, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the things that really drew me to Fiji was that they have, um, the people there basically own the reefs so mm -hmm. that um, if they overfish, that's they're sort of shooting themselves in the foot. Mm. Uh, the way I like to think right. about it is, you know, if if you wanted to go hunt in the U.S., you would have to get permission from the landowner to go, you know, set up a bow stand or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, however, if you want to go fish, you basically just, if, as long as you have a license, you just throw it in the water, right? And so, if the fish get overfished in one area, you know, in in, in the U.S., you just kind of go to the next lake or mm -hmm. you move upstream or something like that. But in Fiji, because the village owns those reefs, um, there is no option of sort of moving to the yeah. next one. And so because they've lived there for hundreds of years, you know, there's uh, there are incentives for them to not overfish. It's this um, 
idea of the, the tragedy of the commons, right? They, sure. There's a, a situation set up where there are incentives for them to long to manage their their fisheries in a long term sustainable fashion. And so I wanted to go there because I was curious to see if this uh, these ideas of conservation that we've developed for terrestrial systems might work in marine systems. Hmm. Um, and so we've had a really good time going through, and and I've been working with the same village for. Um, 12 or 13 years now going through them and working with them about understanding what their marine resources are and, and how to wisely manage them. Mm. Now on a day to day basis, um, a lot of what I do is, is honestly just talking to people. Um, you know, I, I work out in these remote villages and I have to do a formal welcoming ceremony to get into the village. Mm. <clears throat> this welcoming ceremony is called a Sevu Sevu and you present this route to um, what is essentially the the village ombudsman, and he takes it to the chief and the um, the village elders, and then he, on your behalf, formally asks permission to enter into the village and explains what it is that you want to do. Um, they then take the root and they pound it, um, and they make a beverage called kava or yungona, and you drink the kava, and it's sort of a. I mean, many cultures have this sort of liquid. Um, bonding right mm-hmm. like you go here in the u.s oh you went we had beers with the guy yeah, right like that's yeah. sort of the way well yeah. that's when you go you have kava with somebody and it's a way of <laughs> sort of solidifying that social bond and so yeah. we go through the ceremony and we explain what it is that we want to do um and we talk a lot about you know what are you fishing did your grandparents catch this thing how have things changed uh what are some of the threats mm-hmm. there uh and then i go scuba diving and it was really funny because in for my phd i was working with two mostly with two families of fish that are all probably under four inches. And so I would get this big kit, you know, my spears, my scuba diving gear, my net, we'd rent a boat and I go out scuba diving and I come up and I would, I, the, the fishermen were just laughing at me because I come up with a bag full of stuff, the size of their thumbs. And they're like, what, what are you wasting all your energy for? You can't eat these things. And, um, and so that was, that leads to good uh, uh, conversations about, you know, why you use one, some species over the other and, mm-hmm. and patterns of overfishing. Um, and we would just, um, you know, try to preserve the fish and take them back. And and now I put everything that I get um, back in the Museum of Natural History here in New York um, in their frozen tissue collection so that it's available for everybody can check it out. And of course, you can also do some sequencing on the fish if you'd like to know exactly what they are and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. So if I, I ever am in doubt, um, you know, we've got a fairly well-developed suite of mm-hmm. of. Um, biomarkers, usually CO1 gene to be able to barcode what it is. And yeah. which again gets back to why collections are important because if you yeah, don't have sure, a good reference sure. point, then you just have a, a barcode with no tax That's associated right. with it. So and Josh, maybe pull back on with when it comes to field work, maybe pull back the curtain for us a little bit. I mean we whenever someone says that they're going to the field and sort of one of these exotic um, you know, tropical locations, everyone immediately sounds jealous. But at least my impression is that uh, things aren't quite as glamorous and you're not sort of hanging out at the resorts drinking uh, cocktails the whole time. That there's no, some... Not always, but no. <laughs> it has oh, so been it known to happen <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> okay. Well, so, you know, they don't work on Sundays. It's a very, very religious uh, community. And so they, they frown upon us going to work on, on, on the weekend and, or at least on Sunday and uh, their church services are three or four hours long. And so mm-hmm. I usually find an excuse to go and, excuse myself at that point in time. But um, typically the work is um, it's in really remote locations. I remember the, one of the places I went to I actually took my wife to this one, the, the directions to the bathroom were take a left at the goats. Right? So you had to <laughs> kind of go through and shoo the cockroaches out of the hole that is the toilet. And uh, it's getting better though. It's, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm starting to get a little bit older because I'm starting to see these technological changes. Uh, the first time I went to Fiji, um, of, I guess the second time I went to Fiji, I had a cell phone, but it, um, it only worked um, on sort of line of sight to this tower. And I remember I was in this one village. I had to walk out at low tide because that was the only time I could get far enough away from the mountain to be able to see the tower. So I had to <laughs> uh, coordinate my calls home with when it was low tide in Fiji and my, <laughs> my wife was awake. Um, but this last trip out, we had a, a mobile 4G hotspot and we were able to like stream Spotify while we were doing work, uh, that was only about ten years difference. So Technology. that's um, that's definitely making things a lot easier. But there's still challenges. It's it's really hard to get out to these places. It's uh, expensive to get to Fiji. It's not mm-hmm. so bad once you get in there. Um, we're carrying around liquid nitrogen because we want to um, preserve stuff, at, you know, for mm-hmm. RNA work. And so we've got this 
big doer with us that weighs about 35, 40 kilos that we're carrying with us. And, you know, they still don't have the village that I work in doesn't have um, power reliably and it doesn't have running water uh, all the time. And so there's definitely challenges with that. And then, you know, especially um, I love the students that I've worked with and I've been really lucky with that. But, you know, for some of them who have come from sort of suburban U.S. households going into a completely foreign culture has been challenging for them. And I'm proud of them that they've been able to overcome that. But, you know, as a now as a professor, you know, there's there's a certain level of um, shepherding through. I have to work with my trainees that I didn't necessarily had to do as a Ph.D. student. Mm-hmm. So you never go alone on these trips, right? You have to have someone help you with the equipment. And when you jump off the boat, you can't leave the boat floating. Right, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, we actually really try to work as uh, tightly with our Fijian partners as, uh-huh. as possible, not only for sort of capacity building and sort of it's morally just to do so, but I mean, I don't speak enough Fijian to be able to to get the point across on my own. And also just culturally, it, it's not as it's not awesome for me to show up as a, a foreign white guy into a village and just yeah, like, yeah. what's up y'all. You know, I, I really need somebody to act as my liaison. And I've been really grateful to the, um, the Fijian, uh, branch of the WCS, the group that I used to work with, they've been, uh, great in helping me and, and also with the folks at conservation international yeah. to help, uh, facilitate that. You know, at this meeting, a, a big theme was in, in virology. Now we have to go, not me, but the field has to go to other places where outbreaks begin, you know, West Africa, Brazil, uh, wherever. And um, nobody wants to just go in and take samples and bring them home anymore. It's, mm-hmm. That's not right. Yep, yep. You have to build capacity locally. Mm-hmm. And many people are doing that. Notably, Eva Harris at Berkeley mm-hmm. has done that her whole career in Nicaragua. She goes there and teaches them to do everything and then she has a real collaboration and someone put it this way partnerships not parachutes yeah you don't want to go in and get your stuff and (laughs) you want to form a partnership and that makes so much sense yeah there really is this idea of the parachute scientist who who jumps in does work and leaves and then and that's that and at best you know imagine files a report with the ministry in the capital city and one of the great things about this village nainini that i've been working in is that i've been going back for you know, five or seven years now and and they expect me. And one of the things that I do is if I can't take the same student back, I have them make a poster or a presentation and I get everybody, you know, at the village hall together. And I say, so last year we were looking at these experiments. This is the result of that. And this is how it it may Mm -hmm. impact how you run it. Um, Because I really think there is a, if it's possible, you know, it's, it's better to be able to go back and work with the folks because at the end of the day, for the work that I'm doing, the ecology and the conservation is dependent upon what fish they decide to have for dinner. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah, you know yeah. if they don't know that this one is endangered and one is not that, you know, then they are just choosing them for other reasons. So yeah. I think giving that information ultimately behooves the, the, the quality of the science that I'm able to do, but also provides them with better information to help manage their resources. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I mean, just with the kind of democratization of uh, the ability to do sequencing, especially thinking about sort of the emerging virus scenarios, to be able to go in and not have to sort of collect blood or other samples and then bring them back, parachuting in and out, but to be able to set up shop and then actually in the field now start to uh, get a sense for what is, what are the, what's the genomic diversity, how are the, what are the changes here in situ is like, it's really an exciting time for to kind of collide some of these technologies together. Yeah. I mean, if we can sequence on the space station, we should be able to sequence basically (laughs) anywhere else. (laughs) There we go. (laughs) So, uh, you finish your PhD thesis. Do you have a one sentence conclusion from that thesis? Yeah. Fish that look different uh, on the outside are probably different on the inside. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Stunning finding. (laughs) So then you, to defend it, did you have to do it at Woods Hole or go back to Boston? To we had to go back up to Boston. The yeah. the program had actually left midway through my career and, and consolidated up in Boston. And I'm convinced one of the reasons why I got out in five years is because both my advisor and I had houses on the Cape and we stayed there. And so we would have to go up every Wednesday for a seminar. And so as a fourth and fifth year PhD student, mm-hmm. I would we would carpool. And so I would have three hours in the car every week with my advisor. <laughs> like that, that level of access to your advisor is unprecedented. Yeah, is. And so, um, you know, he was able to, the first, the drive up was always, you know, how's your thesis coming? And the drive back was sort of bigger issues in academia. And mm-hmm. it was, you know, not necessarily 
unawkward, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think it was really important for me to be able to, to get that contact with them. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And maybe give us a sense. So what was the kind of timing of your field work versus being back in Boston? How did that play out over your thesis studies? One of the great things about that program was that they had, um, month long classes. So when you were a TA, you did nothing but uh, that course for the month and usually the month preceding it. So I would TA for my advisor, Paul Barber's uh, molecular ecology class in, in February. So January was spent all prepping for it. February was spent all doing the class, but then I got paid for the entire semester. Mm-hmm. So as soon as the class was over at the end of February, I was covered under a TA ship, but I could go off to Fiji for a month, month and a half um, and have that covered. So that was actually a huge benefit for those of us who were doing long-term field or uh, expeditionary field work because, you know, we could go out for serious chunks of time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would try to go out once in the spring and once during the summer while I was gone and then do the the analysis in the fall and try to TA in the winter. Hmm. So that brings us up, I think, to your PhD studies. And then what was the next? Yeah, what's next? What step? happened next? So I wrote a, a <laughs> NSF bioinformatics postdoc with uh, with Mark Westney at the Field Museum, and one of the things we were trying to look at was how you could use um, large scale biogeographic databases to help prioritize conservation. Um, and do, I mean, we did some phylogenetics on that as well. And so that brought me to the Field Museum for two years, and then I was um, either I was soft money for another two years after that, which I wouldn't wish on anybody. Um, <laughs> but I survived. We got through it. Um, and that was a really great opportunity. You know, I, I being a postdoc is such a, an intellectually fertile ground where you have a little bit of money and a lot of time. And you basically are just said, go follow what looks interesting. Mm-hmm. At least mine was, was set up that way. And I really thank Mark for giving me the, the opportunity. And, and it's funny because I remember my October coming in, there was a job opening. I was like, you know, Mark, I, I just got here. I understand that, but there's a, a job opening that I think would be really good for. Do you mind if I apply for it? And I was like, do I have to work on the weekend? Like, I don't know how, if, if I could work on it during the day. And he said, you know, your number one job here is to get a job. And I think hmm. having that supportive mentorship really um, made me not feel weird about writing for job applications while I was there and, and know that he sort of had my back moving forward. And that sort of support was really, really important early on in my career. Hmm. And were you at that time, were you kind of would you look at this as a sort of massive transition away from your thesis work or were you already kind of thinking about how to continue that on? I mean, you invested so much in those relationships and sort of setting up shop. So how did, how did you navigate that territory? Well, so there was this conflict because I did have the social capital of, of the, the friendships and the research relationships in Fiji. And I didn't want that to go away, but you know, people had given me the advice that your postdoc shouldn't be a, a mirror of your PhD work that you need to find you don't want to be a mini whoever you studied with, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I tried to zoom out a little bit from the population genetics and do a little bit more phylogenetics, so I guess deeper evolutionary timeframes. Um, but at the same time, the the postdoc that we wrote was thinking about how to use these these databases. It was a bioinformatics postdoc. Um, and so I ended up thinking about um, how people use bioinformatics for conservation, uh, how we digi- the digitization of museum collections is important, mm-hmm. how the distribution is limited by technology in developing countries and what ways we can uh, help deal with that. And then what sort of large-scale biogeographic patterns can you get if you have really good databases that are taxonomically broad? Um, and so that allowed me to think about similar, in, in the same area, but about different topics a little bit and zoom out a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was able to do some work in Fiji. I um, I did some collections in there. We described a new species of damselfish from around there. So that was cool. Um, and we ended up hosting a meeting out there, which brought a lot of researchers from the area uh, together, as well as folks from, um, from the U.S. in there. And I think it was important to host it in Fiji to sort of, um, you know, require, uh, sorry, <laughs> rephrase that, um, I think it was important to host it in Fiji because I think it, it sort of gave respect to the, the, the capacity that was already in the country. And, you know, frankly, the, a lot of the folks at the University of South Pacific are doing great science on incredibly small budgets. And if mm-hmm. it's 1500 bucks for them to come over to the U S to go to the, you know, evolution meetings, that's, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. And so I think by bringing us over to them, it really increased the diversity of the meeting because we were able to get the faculty there, um, to attend an international meeting that was in their backyard. And more importantly, I think the students were uh, were able to go to, because there's no way the students are, are generally going to be able to go attend an international meeting that way. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then with the help of Vicky Funk from the, the National Museum, the Smithsonian, we were able to get um, society memberships for all of the, um, the students who attended uh, for the, um, the Biogeography Society, which meant that they were able to access all of those journals for free, hmm. um, which I thought was one of the things we really wanted to do to kind of sweeten the pot and to get them um, thinking about participating at international science and not just focusing in on their backyard, but becoming citizens of this sort of hmm. global discourse that we have. Hmm. So it sounds like you might've um, curtailed a little bit of your field work to spend some more time in Chicago during your postdoc. Yes. It's yep. Not coincidentally, I, uh, my wife had some kids, hmm. so that, <laughs> uh, that helps uh, keep you home as yeah. well. So um, that was something that was really important to be able to um, not go away for six weeks at a time when we had, you know, a, a one and a four year old or something like that yeah. at home. That's, mm -hmm. that's challenging. So um, yeah, there was a little less field work, but, um, but I was also in the museum. So there was so much data to be had just from within the museum itself that I didn't feel sort of bereft of opportunities. It just was looking at a, a different sorts of data. Yeah, absolutely. You know, maybe this is an important conversation because a lot of people probably don't appreciate the the way that museums and biologists intertwine now and have for some time but even more so in the genomic era right? yeah that's right and so for you know someone like me who sort of grew up as a cell biologist and thinking about molecular stuff where mm. the field was sort of yeah, uh, it's distant right. it's really fun to sort of compare notes to see some of the parallels in these paths so this idea of doing a thesis topic but then something distinct as a postdoc i think that's something that's shared broadly across a lot of mm -hmm. yeah. um yeah biological um, sort of endeavors or programs. Um, but of course, very different components as well, which we sometimes think we can get stuck in our canyons from time to time. And well, so it's good to peek around and... and we're, we're in a transition era where yeah. people like me who are trained to stay in your canyon, you know, you had one virus, mm -hmm. one isolate, mm -hmm. and that's what you would work on. I mean, it took us one year to get the sequence of that one isolate, <laughs> so we weren't going to go out and get 10,000 more. Yeah. Nowadays, it's totally different. And uh, Sarah Sawyer was at this meeting at Boston yeah, University, yeah. colleague of yours, yeah. and she said during her talk, most virologists never study their virus in its true ecological context. Mm -hmm. you, know, you bring it into your laboratory and you study it there. Of course, there was a few grumblings from the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I think Ralph Barrick went, hey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Like me, I never did it, and uh, we still don't, although we do work with more isolates than we ever did, but... Um, Virology, like other fields, like evolution is changing. You go out in the field and do things like you've been telling us about. Yeah. yeah. So I, I feel like I'm being a little disingenuous because um, the vast majority of the work that I was doing was was genetic. And so I would go out to the field for six weeks, but the rest of the time I was I was in the lab. And so, sure. you know, I, I, I play up the field work because it's fun and, and it really sort of fulfills a, a hole in my soul. Like mm. I feel like I need to get out in the field and see the reefs and, and that inspires me to do the conservation work. But like, if you probabilistically just picked me uh, out of the museum <laughs> on a random day, you know, I was moving small volumes of clear liquid from one tube to another. Yeah. That's what we do too. Mm -hmm. right? So, but that's, that's cool though. I mean, that's yeah, one of the yep. points that like, you know, getting out of these canyons, a lot of the tools are, are the same. And, and that's why it's fun to be able to talk to people from other canyons, I guess, is that yeah. you're unified by this, like, oh, micro channel pipettes or something like that. Sure. But, um, <laughs> you know, the robots down, you know, these things that are, are yeah. common to, to all of us. But um, it's just really fun to see how those key ideas of evolution and molecular biology can be applied so very, very broadly. I think that's one of the things that's really fascinating and really exciting about the the world that we live in now. Yep, moving forward. Well, so you know, of, can I just yeah, first, one please. last yeah. thought? Uh, even those of us in canyons, me, 30 years ago, the virus had to come from somewhere. Oh, Someone yeah. had mm -hmm. to get it from a person either in the U.S. or in Africa or Asia, whatever. So there was always a little bit of field work, but now virology has changed a lot because we have to find out the origins of viruses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I also don't want to downplay the importance of taking a single strain and, in a sense, almost domesticating it and then yeah. studying it really deeply because this has been, again and again, these principles and concepts just apply across oh, all of biology. I mean, this so, is a, yeah. we're in a very tough time in virology because there's a little conflict between people who want to take one gene and bash it extensively, mm -hmm. and from that 
huge concepts can emerge mm -hmm. versus other people who want to go to Africa and get 600 full-length Ebola virus sequences and see what you make of it, right? Yeah. It, is, it is a conflict. It is, although that's, you know, going forward, can we sidestep that as a conflict and see how these things might synergize? Sure. And that's, you know, I think that's what got us um, when we were sitting down at the bar thinking about Twivo and what we might do. That for me, and I think for you, is like one of the things that really motivated us to try to um, break open yeah. some of these I mean, I think there's room for both kinds of investigation mm -hmm. because the 600 sequences of a single gene you can bring back and say look at this residue mm -hmm. and this is influencing interaction with some cell protein etc you know yeah it's, it's really just, fun yeah it's, it's great yeah, great yeah. stuff oh, I, I interrupted no not at all so i was just gonna say we've now um we've spent some time at the field museum in chicago but then moving forward from that how did you transition from uh your postdoc to your current situation i wrote a lot a lot a lot of job applications <laughs> <laughs> and occasionally they came through. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I work a lot with incoming graduate students and a big part of my job is, um, is giving them honest advice as to the lay of the land for academia. And, and part of that is being open with, um, with failure. I mean, we talked about, mm -hmm. um, that book and, and how, you know, failure is, is part of, of the academic environment. And so, you know, it was not a great time to be on the market and I just wrote and wrote and wrote and eventually got a couple, um, couple opportunities. And I was really excited to come back to New York because I was from this area. My mother-in-law is, is pretty close around here and we had, um, two small kids and, you know, the getting back to the idea of being on soft money. One of the things with soft money is like, you know, you're funded for six months, but you don't know mm -hmm. where you're funded after that. And so, you know, like our apartment was great, but it wasn't, or it was okay, but it wasn't great. It was good enough for, to be for six months, but like if we knew we were going to be there for an extended period of time, we would have moved else. Our car was kind of breaking down, but it was <laughs> just enough. We're in Chicago, didn't really need to drive anywhere. But again, it was like if we know that we had job security for multiple years, we probably would have pulled in, uh, pulled out a different one. And you know, my son was uh, older; son was getting ready to start kindergarten, and. You know that you don't want to sort of be like, eh, good enough. So, um, <laughs> so it was it was time to find something that was permanent. And so, when the opportunity to come here to Columbia opened up, you know, we were really excited about it. Now, with your training up to that point, is is academics the only thing you could do? No, I had done some work uh, with conservation, and I had considered that as well. But um, I liked mm -hmm. the the teaching aspect. Um, I should say one of the key things that uh, helped me make that transition to actually getting a job is I had a, a, a purely research postdoc uh, and I TA'd for what it's worth as a, a PhD student. So I didn't really have much teaching experience and I recognized that that was a shortcoming. So I actually cold called one of the local colleges in Chicago and said, do you have an opportunity for me to teach a course? Mm. And they needed somebody to teach a course grandiosely called the history of life, um, <laughs> which they had somebody and he dropped out. And so they, they needed somebody to teach it. And, and the, the, the chair was like, here, have this course. And, and I did a, a lab section of cellular molecular biology. Mm -hmm. And that really, that demonstrably opened up doors in terms of me getting callbacks on interviews, because at that point in time, my teaching statement was not, I think this would be fun to like, this is how I deal with diversity in the classroom. This is how I deal with non-traditional students. And it, it made it much more realistic. And after that, I started getting, uh, not a lot, but at least I started getting interviews. So I think, hmm. um, you know, part of the being a postdoc, it's really sort of liminal period. But one of the things that you need to do is take a, a or at least have a friend take a very cold hearted look at your CV and say, you're missing these things and take the opportunity to, to try to find ways to fill those holes. And yeah. for me, I clearly had no teaching experience. And once I got that, I, um, well, I was much more competitive I, and I found that I liked it. And so I, I'm here at Columbia and I'm in a primarily teaching focused position, mm -hmm. um, where I teach five classes a semester. Wow. Or, sorry, sorry. Five a year, five a year. <laughs> five still, a year. still a lot. <laughs> still a lot. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> so yeah, so I teach five classes a year and I, I direct the, the master's program. Um, so there's a lot going on, um, but I enjoy being able to teach and it's a real privilege to be working with yeah. the students because mm -hmm. they're, mm -hmm. they're wicked smart. And, uh, and I enjoy that aspect of it. Do you, t do you teach at all at Utah? Yeah, I do. So I'm in the medical school. And so teaching is, you know, maybe not as big of a focus, yeah. but um, there are certainly opportunities. And in fact, one of the fun things that um, I'm up to now is designing a new course for our incoming hmm. first year grad students. Um, and to kind of, what we're, what the goal of the class is actually, which is called critical thinking, kind of a broad topic, is to sort of transition from the um, 
you know, textbook style of learning that a lot of our incoming grad students mm-hmm. have been exposed to. Everyone is also exposed to some lab experience, but actually putting that together is sometimes not completely obvious. And so how do we yeah. kind of break in? And so that's where um, we're taking your colleague's book, um, Failure, Stuart Farstein's yeah, book, great. and giving it to them for their <laughs> holiday reading as a way of sort yeah, of breaking the ice. Like and so, yeah, like yeah, we'll see how. So all, all this feels like an experiment, right? We Even yeah. as if we're doing research, we're doing experiments, but if we're teaching, we're doing experiments. I think sure. if we, it's fun to think of it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that's a real privilege is to be able to to work with students as they just start and and see them make that transition from being information consumers to information producers, mm. um, where they realize that the mm. they can't look the answer up in a book because yeah. the answer has yet to be written. And that's really exciting. And that's a real privilege for them to be able to go through and, and be the first person to understand that. Yeah, my, one of my colleagues at ASM, Elio Schechter, has a blog, and he periodically writes what he calls a Talmudic question where you can't find the answer on the internet. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> you got to yeah. think about it. So when you first came to Columbia, it was about five years ago now, you said, yep. right? What were, you, what were you planning on doing in your lab? Um, keeping my head above water, I think, is the, <laughs> the very honest answer. I think um, coming in as a new faculty member without having uh, a whole lot of experience in it and, and, and diving in, no pun intended, um, with you know, two courses yeah. and doing a tenure relief on a third, um, there was a, there was a lot going on and there was a lot of writing lectures late at night and just trying to figure out, you know, what, what to do next. Um, so it took me a little while to get my, my feet under me, but I was lucky enough to, um, to get a grant fairly early on to be able to go out to Fiji and to be able to work with some honors students. So I, I didn't recruit grad students mm-hmm. initially, but I had some pretty talented seniors who were, or juniors who are going to be seniors who wanted to do senior honors research. Mm -hmm. And so I had some pretty smart students join the lab pretty early on and start thinking about what are some of the big issues. Um, And I had come in primarily wanting to work on coral reef conservation, but I had this, um, this paper come out um, from work that I'd done at the field museum, looking at shark tooth weapons and historical ecology. And that really, um, I found that surprisingly exciting me a lot more than I thought it would. Hmm. And so while I came in sort of wanting to do pretty much ecology and evolution of, of coral reef organisms, and I still do that, um, this, this parallel and complementary research um, interest has sort of developed on it. And that's been really fun to see how that's matured as well. And, and the two can work together synergistically. They don't necessarily have to. And so trying to balance out how much of my intellectual bandwidth I spend on each is, is something that I, I struggle with a little bit, but um, both of them I find incredibly engaging. And it's just such an honor and a privilege to have a job where basically I like going to work and, and my, my job duty, broadly speaking, is to answer interesting questions and help students become better. Yeah. So maybe let's back up a second. So when you say <laughs> historical ecology, maybe define that a little bit for us. That was, <laughs> that's good. a new, new right. term for me. Me yeah. too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So historical ecology is um, is basically the the science of using non traditional data sets to understand what the world looked like prior to the collection of formal data sets. Hmm. Um, so in this case, I had um, I was a, a while well, I was a postdoc at the Field Museum. I was actually doing all these interviews, and, and interviews are really really stressful. And I would come back, and I just wanted to have some a place where I could go, and it was dark and it was quiet, and I could just relax. And I just wanted to look at the collections. And so we have these swords that are made out of coconut wood and are festooned with shark teeth that come from the central Pacific in, and they were collected by um, largely by whalers in the 1860s. And they were brought back as whalers were dudes and dudes like swords and swords plus sharks is even more (laughs) attractive, right? So they would bring these things back. Um, And they were all in the uh, anthropology collections because they're a good example of what this culture looked like in the central Pacific. The thing is, shark teeth are identifiable to species. And so while these were collected to record the cultural diversity, they inadvertently recorded the biological diversity. And so what we were able to do um, was to go through and identify what each one of the species present on those shark teeth were. And and the cool thing was, is that we found that two species of shark were present um, in the 1860s but had been extirpated, so locally driven to extinction prior to the first formal scientific survey of those reefs. And so had we not done this work, we would have never known that those sharks once plied those waters. Mm-hmm. And so that was a, a really, I mean, that was really exciting. And this is papers 
came out in 2012 and I still 13 and I still get excited about it. Mm, yeah, it's, great. It was a really fun project. Um, but you know, to think that had we not done this, we would have never known what those reefs look like is, is just fundamentally interesting and that they went extinct before we ever, or they became extirpated before we ever knew that they were there. That's one of those things that really motivates me because that strikes me as fundamentally sad that we're losing biological diversity before we even knew know what it is mm -hmm. that it's just running like sand between our fingertips you know mm -hmm. and and so historical ecology is a great way to be able to go back and try to see what things used to be like before we started um you know doing what we do to ecosystems mm -hmm. so and it sounds like um you've also taken this idea and you're extending it in some exciting new directions so i was just perusing the um, atlantic a few weeks ago or maybe even a week or so ago and saw an interesting article from Ed Young, whose name comes up quite often on Twivo, um, mentioning some of your more recent work, um, kind of in this area of historical ecology, but looking at whalers and what they were doing. So what's... How yeah, you know, one out? of the nice things about the department at Columbia is they gave me the opportunity to create some classes that are in my wheelhouse. And one of the ones that I really wanted to do was a class on historical ecology because the the literature was disparate and I wanted to have an excuse to go synthetically read through it. And I wanted to have a group of smart people to talk to, to go through the literature. So it wasn't just me reading it by myself. And so I, um, I submitted a class to do a, a proposal to do a class on historical ecology. And I had uh, six undergrads in the class with me. And basically I would lecture for an hour and then we would read two papers and we would do a, uh, a Twivo like uh, <laughs> in-depth discussion of those papers. And it was really great because with only six, there's nowhere to hide, right? So everybody did the reading and everybody mm -hmm. really chimed in and it was a great exploration to go through. But I, I was concerned because I feel like there's this belief that um, when you become a graduate student, you, you magically become able to write papers, or at least there's the assumption that you know how to write papers. And, <laughs> and I, that's not the case, right? And so I wanted to have my students have some real research experience. And so for the midterm, I asked them to go through the digitized logbooks of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, a museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts, that has about uh, a little under 80 logs, logbooks that, of whalers that have been mm -hmm. digitized. And I wanted them to go through and see what sorts of, of organisms were being caught. Um, and it was originally going to be just sort of a midterm write-up, but um, one of my students, uh, Elora Lopez, who's now doing her PhD at Stanford in Steve Palumbi's lab, um, said, this was so interesting. Can we can we keep doing it? And I was like, well, sure. I mean, yeah. this is pretty cool. These are things that are accessible online, I presume? Yeah. Yeah. The, we so did, anybody could find these. You don't have to go up to New Bedford. No. Uh, and that's sort of getting back to the earlier point about why digitization of museum yeah. records is important because- mm -hmm. I didn't have a budget or the time to schlep everybody up to New Bedford, but we could just log on from the dorms and they could read it wow. that way. Um, <laughs> so the students really got into it and uh, I wrapped up class about two weeks early. And for those last two weeks, we sat through and we figured out how one writes a paper. And I, I don't know how you guys do it, but I like to think about what are the stories the data are telling us, uh, which ones have already been told and which ones have, sort of have legs. Um, and then, so we, we figured out which story we wanted to go with. And then for me anyway, the next thing is to, what are the figures in the, the paper? Mm -hmm. What is, how do we graphically represent what the experiment was and what the results were? And so we sat through and we said, well, what sort of figures would we like to have for this to be able to illustrate the point? And then once that happened, I, you know, put one student on getting all the relevant information and writing up a, a essentially the introduction. And a couple of students were, who, who are familiar with R got together and started doing some of the data analyses and other students were looking at um, maybe sources that we hadn't initially thought of. And we sort of farmed it out like any research mm -hmm. collaboration does. Mm -hmm. And, and we brought it back, but it was great because it was part of class. So every Tuesday and I guess it was Tuesday and Thursday for two, for an hour and a half, we had a dedicated time to think about this. And I, you know, thinking as a, as a researcher now, like it would be great if I had three hours a week where me and my mm. entire team got together and all we did was think about how to write this paper. Yeah, there um, you go. Because it, it never seems to work that way, <laughs> sort of right. at the the professional level, but at the class level, it, it was mm. great. And um, you know, I hate writing abstracts, uh, and so for the final exam, I made them write the abstract, and I sort of pieced <laughs> together the abstract based from there. Um, and we were able to submit it, and um, you know, it got rejected initially, uh, which again is a learning experience and it got rejected with really good comments. And I told them that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. we're now going to have a better version of what it was that we came up with. And, um, and so we, 
resubmitted it and we recently got it published. That's so great. It's great for them. Yeah. And tell us a little bit what the story is here. So it sounds like you were looking at these whaling records, but there was more than just met the eye. From yeah. That. Sorry. I, I got distracted. No, so no, not at all. The story of how the paper came <laughs> around okay. and talk about so what the actual story was. Yeah. Um, so the fact that the, the Yankee whaling industry took out large amounts of whale biomass is, is pretty well known. I mean, people have read Moby Dick. Um, people, scientists have looked at what the, tried to estimate the amount of biomass that was taken out. And, and we know that that had a big impact on the ocean. Whales are important for biogeochemical cycling. They are by definition where whale fall communities find. And so um, the fact that we had a lot of whales taken out was interesting, but kind of non, but kind of trivial. But what was fascinating was that these logs also reported the other stuff that they were catching. And that hadn't made its way in a, a thorough way into the literature yet. And so we suddenly had this really cool data set of everything other than the great whales that those sailors were catching. And so what we did is we went through and we looked at um, about 80 logs from about 75 voyages. A couple of them uh, were doubles. And we were able to look at um, the taxonomic diversity, so the different types of species that were caught, the weights of the, caught, of the, of the organisms that they were caught, and, and where they were caught. And the thing, so the couple of things that came out that were really interesting, one, that there really was a tremendous amount of biomass that was being taken out. On average, um, whalers, each, each vessel at, per day at sea, was taking out about 75 pounds of biomass. So mm. um, think of 300 sticks of butter. Mm. Right? That's how much each vessel was taking out each day at sea. And we looked at 200 vessel years for our study. And there, that was about 4% of mm. the total number of vessels that were out there. So wow. if you do the multiplication, it's a, a certainly a non-trivial amount taken out. Mm. But the So that was cool. But then the other thing was the spatial distribution of that. So it was non-random. And in some cases, it was um, it was terrestrial, and that was the thing that really blew my mind because these are whaling voyages, like they're marine harvesting. The fact that they would have terrestrial impo- impacts was not at all on my radar, and so that was really cool to see that um, that they had this this uh, impact on these terrestrial ecosystems. And, and the story was, and this is why historical ecology is great because it's not just data, but it's 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 history, so you mm. could draw from a lot of different sources. The whalers were going after these bowhead whales. Um, these bowhead whales were really, really valuable. Bowheads are, are Arctic whales. And so they're only available during a, a narrow window when the Arctic Ocean is, is ice-free. And so the whalers would go up there and they would hunt like hell during the, uh, during the summer months. Remember, it's summer, so it's, it's 24-hour sunshine. So they would you know, be incredibly intensive harvesting there. And then the money was so good that in some cases they – chose to froze themselves or freeze themselves over so that would be there right when the next season started uh and in other cases they guessed wrong and they were inadvertently frozen over and and there's a a a whaling disaster of 1871 where about 35 vessels were lost it um, because of the they got they got iced in Mm. Uh, so rather purposely or or by accident these folks were then stranded there over the winter and they would essentially send out these away teams to go supplement their food because they had sort of hard tack and, you know, pemmican and stuff like that. Um, and they would go out and they would hunt ptarmigan and caribou, polar bear, and tons and tons of walrus. Hmm. And the walrus was hunted not only for sustenance, but uh, walruses were fat enough that you could render that oil down so you could get some additional, it's not whale oil quality, but you could still get that. And then of course, scrimshaw on the tusks. So there, there was sort of a, a two for one on, on the walruses. And we found that um, the estimates that they killed as many walruses during 1850 to 1890 as are now alive today. Wow. Um, and then the other thing that was really, so there's two, um, two facets of that terrestrial impact uh, that I found fascinating. And totally unexpected. And that's one of the things that I love about doing science is when you get wander down these de- corridors and find doors that you didn't expect to open. Um, that's, that's neither here nor there. That's just me loving science. So two things that came out of it. One, um, a lot of these high Arctic islands are now being used as our baselines to understand climate change. So people are looking at um, how the ratio of sort of tall plants to short plants is a function of how warm it is and, and what the permafrost is like. And these high Arctic islands, people assumed were quote unquote pristine, 
But it turns out that the whalers and others had taken out hundreds of thousands of caribou off from this one island, Herschel Island. And so when you think about if we're looking at what the vegetation is like, and there used to be hundreds of thousands more mouths eating that vegetation, then our baseline is already perturbed. Our baseline has already shifted even before we started thinking about the climate change. And so if we want to understand how climate change is impacting our high Arctic ecosystems, well, we, we're, we're playing with a moving bar here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, the predictions, not that climate change is good in, in any way, but the predictions are, and quantifying the ecosystem impacts of climate change, um, when you have that shifted baseline, you know, that, that means that the, the comparison is, um, is influenced by factors that arrived prior to you getting there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to recognize, you know, you don't want to set your baseline too low, or you want to set your baseline to a system that had already been disturbed. You want to set it for what a quote unquote natural system would be. So in a case like that, we could be even underestimating the impact that humans have had over even short amounts of time, because what we're defining as pristine is actually already somehow degraded. Yeah. It already gone through the maw of the, the, the whalers or, mm -hmm. um, or the, the, the food had gone through the maw of the whalers. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, when you want to, you want to have very solid baselines in any sort of scientific endeavor, that's your control essentially here. And so what we're seeing here is that the control had been disturbed and, and we weren't factoring that in when looking at what the experimental design was. Why would they keep such detailed logs of what they caught? They had nothing else to do. I mean, you think about it, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're there, it's dark, 18, 19 hours. There's out no of the internet. Day. <laughs> the the, the right. Wi-Fi is horrible in the 1800s. <laughs> so, um, you know, a lot of times it was just writing down what was there. Oh my um, gosh. What was really interesting is that um, we, in the cases where we had double ups or two people on the vessel keeping independent journals, we mm -hmm. could see how much variability there was between it. And so cool. the point I want to mention <laughs> is that the this is a tremendous underestimate. Yeah. Um, so the other uh, un unknown door that we we were led to is first there's this impact on setting baselines for climate change. But the other um, was the uh, the opening up of the, the cardiometabolic epidemic, which is facing people in the high Arctic. So what would happen is these, um, these traders would essentially set up uh, a, a post, the Hudson, um, the Hudson Bay company was a real, one of the first ones there mm -hmm. and whalers would come in and they would trade um, for caribou and ptarmigan so we had caribou and tarbing it in, and they would send out things like molasses and flour and fried goods. And so you start seeing the introduction mm -hmm. of this really um, detrimental diet into the high Arctic peoples. And coupled with that, because there was a uh, basically an unlimited source of food through the trade house, you know, through the, the Hudson Bay Company, um, you see a sedentation of people. So the whalers were coming out and they were killing off the whales and the walruses. So reducing the amount of food that high Arctic mm. people could naturally have, plus the addition of sugar and molasses through this centralized area. Suddenly you don't have people traveling around as far following the movements of the animals. You have them coming in every day and basically trading it in. And if you look at mm. levels of cardiometabolic disease in the high Arctic people, um, according to the WHO, they're in the, the second most prevalent uh, population for for obesity. And I'm not saying it's all started with this one whaling coming up on Herschel Island, but it's a really nice illustration of how um, what was essentially a, a marine extractive activity had this trickle down impact that we still see the replications of today. Mm, yeah. So in this paper, it sounds like it's a, just about to come out. It might time out really nicely with the release of yeah, our episodes. Yeah. So where should we be looking for your for the, this paper? Right. So one of the things we really wanted to do was to publish it open access because we wanted to have as many people um, possible be able to read it, um, particularly those who may be in less well-off communities. Um, we wanted to make sure that First Nation and, and, and High Arctic folks were able to get it. And, and basically, it's just such an interesting story. We wanted to lower the barrier of people being able to learn about their history. Um, so we want to make sure we publish it in open access and it's in the journal ecology and evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, on your website, you mentioned that you frequently like to use open access for these reasons, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, a lot of times I do work in developing countries in Fiji, Papua New Guinea, et cetera. Um, and, and they just don't have, um, you know, asking a student at the university of Papua New Guinea to pay $35 to look at a, <laughs> a journal article is just not going to happen. Yeah. You know, this all started, yeah. Yeah. um, I led an expedition to, to PNG, Papua New Guinea, when I was a postdoc. 
in 2011, I was in the Ministry of Fisheries office trying to to get the requisite permits, and we could see reefs that I had papers about from his office, but he couldn't access those papers. So he could see the reef, yeah, but he yeah. couldn't see the science that was it's done crazy. on the reef. Yeah. It's and, crazy. And how are you going to ask people to, to best manage their resources if that information that they need to manage it is locked away? And so- um, This I've, is a big problem with science publishing, which we talk about all the time. That's right. And uh, open access is great, but someone has to pay for it. It is. And you know? we're really lucky that Columbia has uh, a, a small fund to help pay for some of the open access charges. Yeah. And so- um, I'm very fortunate and and those people know me well because I keep sending them my papers. Um, But if I didn't have that sort of position of privilege, you know, this article in Hmm. uh, Ecology Evolution is $2,200 plus is up to $1,450 now. That's about as much as it takes me to take a grad student to come out to Fiji. And so if I didn't have the the largesse of Columbia University Hmm. behind me, I would have to make this decision about do I want to advance science by bringing another student out or do I want to advance science by paying virtually the same amount <laughs> yep. to publish yep. the paper? I tell you, that largesse does not extend to the medical center. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Here at the medical that. center, this is this is basically a soft money place, right? We have to raise our salary. We have to pay for our papers. You get probably nine months salary down there, right? I do. Yeah, we don't get that. But we have to get it off our grants. Yeah. Sorry. And I if I said, it up then. If I, no, no, it's <laughs> fine. I, I don't, I, I think science has got big issues that have to be fixed. Um, but unfortunately, open access costs money. So, you know, the only reason the PLOS journals work is because of PLOS One, which has generated such a huge amount of income that they didn't expect. Yeah, that's right. And not every open access journal can do that. But, um, you know, if I asked my chairman to pay for the costs, he would laugh like crazy. <laughs> if take it off your grant, you know, <laughs> but that's okay. Well, it certainly illustrates how <laughs> applying more resources to science in general would not be wasted on um, kind of trivial things. There's no, or, there's all. plenty of great ways that we could continue to invest in science across the board. Yeah, and you know, I I recognize the position of privilege that I have, and I don't want to. Um, uh, I feel like a lot of the debate of open access sometimes gets a little. Um, there's some proselytizing going on, mm. and I recognize that, and I certainly support open access for the reasons we just talked about. But I'm never going to sort of castigate somebody for not doing it or for choosing to spend sure, their sure. money to do something else because it's I'm, it's not like they're spending it on martinis and cigars, you know. Like like you <laughs> well, said, Nelson, look, it's going to I mean, places. The yeah. problem is we do we have this dual um, system where we have open access journals and then we have luxury journals, at least in in the biomedical sciences. You know, we have cell science and nature, and everyone wants a paper there so they can get a job or a grant or a promotion or whatever. And it's hard to pull away from that, right? It would be mm-hmm. great to have the PLOS journals determine your career. I would feel better about that than Cell Science Nature, but you're never going to get everybody away from those all at once. So it's a long-term proposition to change. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I can't, I, I rail against these journals and then my lab wants to publish in them. I can't tell them no. Mm-hmm. It's their career. Right. It, it's sort of the, the individual good versus the, the communal right. good. Mm-hmm. But you're right. I think that's a great example. The guy sees the reef and he can't read the paper. You know, someone has a sick kid and they want to read a paper about the disease and it's behind a paywall. Yeah. I think, and this is, you know, for biomedical research, it's taxpayer money, so it's not fair. Right. I don't want to, I, I do this all the time. This I get is a off. common topic, a common theme that I'm sure will continue to come Sorry up. Sorry about our, that. No, not at all. No, this it's something whole, we think a lot about. That's right. And we'll continue to wrestle with our so this, careers. Uh, Ed Young calls you a uh, histor- historical ecologist, right? Is that what he said here? Mm-hmm. He said, uh, Josh... Is a historical ecologist, Drew. Sorry, <laughs> he called you by his, by your last name. Drew is a historical ecologist. Would you agree with that? Um, I mean, or as much favorite. as I publish papers on historical ecology, sure. Yeah, you have done that. Yeah, mm-hmm. this is cool. Very cool story. Good that you picked this up. I wouldn't have seen this. You peruse Atlantic. Uh, I think no. this one, yeah, this showed up on my Twitter stream. I feel like I have enough sort of ah. tentacles out there where um, people are posting interesting links, and this one came up. And then when I saw Josh's. Work was being highlighted, of it's course, cool. that perked up my radar. By the way, there's one line from this article I really love. Mm. Humans were changing the world long before we realized it. To take the full measure of what we've done, to fully understand how far the natural world has fallen, and to appreciate how far we have to go to restore it, we need to rely on unconventional sources of data. I think that's beautiful. Yeah. That's why he's such a great writer. And what kills me, there are people that think we've done nothing to the earth. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, crazy. You know, it, 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 you cannot 
believe in climate change. Where you, you have to because the data are there, but you just read uh, Josh's paper. That's right. See how much we've changed yeah. it. That's in the record. There's no doubting that. Right? Exactly. <laughs> so, and I'm curious, Josh. So, I mean, this seems like a really cool way of sort of delving into historical records in new ways or taking advantage of existing museum collection. So do you see this as sort of a growth industry, this historical ecology? Are there just sort of these pockets of really cool um, data sets almost, so to speak, just hiding out that we that you intend to continue mining or that you would point people to? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's plenty of things left to be explored. And I think you're limited uh, in part by your creativity. Um, the, the biggest problem with doing historical ecological research is that you can never generate new data. Uh, you can't <laughs> go and say, oh, if only we had data from you know, the, the Galapagos in the 1600s. Well, unless somebody was there and they wrote it down, you aren't going to be able to go back in time and do it. And so in in sort of regular biology, if you need to increase your sample size, you can go and you can do another experiment or you can add more plates or something like that. And, and we are not uh, able to do that, unfortunately. So I think that's probably going to be the biggest limiting resource is just being able to find that. But, um, you know, in teaching this class, it gave me an opportunity to go and, and really think about it. And writing lectures is a very, uh, it's like a three to one ratio of the three hours of prep time for every hour of lecture. And so I got to really dive into a lot of different topics. And, you know, I have two or three more papers that I'm I'm hoping to work on based on available data sets from this. So hmm. it's definitely not not going to be the last of it. Um, and there's still plenty of work to be done with the shark tooth weapons. Um, hmm. So there's more to come out of it. Um, but I don't know if we're going to start seeing a historical ecologist on every department <laughs> moving forward. Um, <laughs> Well, and I can definitely see your point that there's sort of a limited, there must be some sort of a ceiling here, right? That's bound by how much historical record there is. But how about looking forward? Are we as, uh, are we doing enough today to document uh, how things are changing or what is on the scene now for maybe generations ahead for historical, uh, nascent historical ecologists to look back? Or are there things that you would, given your experience here, are there things that we should be collecting or cataloging that we're sort of missing the boat on? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and I think um, there's not a field scientist alive who leaves the field satisfied with all the different types of data that they had taken. Hmm. There's there's always the, oh, I wish I had remembered to write down what the weather was like or what the tides were like at that point in time or what the name of this plant was that the village villagers were using to, you know, to to uh, kill off insects in their house or something like that. So, so yes, there's always more information that, that one can take, um, getting back to this, I guess, what is an emergent theme in this, this podcast, the value of collections. I think this is why it's important to be able to go back and resample them. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, one of the critiques we have about funding collections is that, oh, you already have 15,000 butterflies pinned why do you need what's the additive value of the 15,000th and first Mm. and in part you know you want to see have a intense data rich collection over multiple years in the same location to be able to look at this environmental change over time and if you don't make those repeated collections there's going to be a gap there and and historical ecologists in 2200 are going to be like why didn't they collect that Mm -hmm. you know that september it's the only gap in there yeah 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 good point I want to take this opportunity to tell listeners about a sponsor of this episode's Curiosity Stream, the f- world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles, 600 hours of content. The company was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. So what you're going to get is real science, not reality TV that plagues the cable. You can get it on many platforms. You can get it on your web browser or any of the hardware devices like Roku, Android, iOS, Chromecast, Amazon Fire, and Kindle, Apple TV that interface the web with your TV. 196 countries worldwide. And what they have is a wide variety of science and technology. They also have nature, history, and many more topics. Uh, For example, they have interviews and lectures. They include Stephen Hawking's Universe. This is a multi-part series where he traces the history of astronomical theories and technology. Deep Time History is a three-part original documentary series that tells the story of the 14-billion-year history of the universe. And Underwater Wonders of the National Parks. This is the 100th anniversary of the U.S. National Park Service this year, and they have a seven-part series that takes you underneath the bodies of water in the national parks. 
They have one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around over 50 hours of ultra high definition content. And they have monthly and annual plans available. They start at just $2.99 a month, less than a cup of coffee. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe during sign up and you'll get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of Twivo. Yeah, lots of great stuff in there and things that might inspire some future historical ecologists to dig deeper in, into some of these topics well, that we've been talking you know, about they, today. They have a lot of stuff um, that relates to what we're talking about today, field studies. Mm. You know, And I was talking to David Quammen, the, the writer. Of, do you know David Quammen? Absolutely, yeah. His song for the Dodo was fantastic. fantastic. <laughs> so I interviewed him last week in Boston, and he said he loves going on trips with field biologists. You know, he, he's been to Africa, trekking through the Congo, and he says, that, that way you meet people, and you talk to them, and you get stories, and that's what people like to hear about science. You know, you, you can put the science in, but put stories about people. So he went to Africa and to the where Ebola first started, and he met someone whose whole family had died, and what a story that is to intersperse with the virus itself. So he'd probably love to come on a field trip with you as well. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to sit in my lab, of course, or Nels's lab, <laughs> yeah, because there's right. nothing interesting there. But that's it. He says, everything starts somewhere. So go to where it started. Huh. Um, and so that is uh, just so cool. And I'll bet you can find lots of that on Curiosity Stream. In fact, Nels, why don't you do a little talking? I'm going to look and see oh, yeah, what take kind a, of stuff take we a peek. can find here. So while you're doing that, Vincent, uh, so we've been talking about historical ecology for the Wait, last- I actually have one but, small part. Oh, yeah, 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 please, go ahead. So we actually use Curiosity Stream in my class. Ah, you're um, kidding. Yeah, this- um, <laughs> And they aren't giving me money. They're just an awesome service. Um, I'm teaching a class on coastal and estuarine ecology this year. And, and one of the things we're having the students learn to be uh, our critical consumers of science and how it's communicated. Mm. And so what we're having them do uh, every week, they have to choose a documentary on marine biology writ large and and critique it. Talk mm. about what are some of the biases in it um, as Vincent was saying some of them are are far more than are more on the reality TV side than the actual one and, and talk about sort of what are the advantages and disadvantages of that. And it's been really fun. So it's a little bit of of uh, ecology meets media studies, but um, being able to go through and, and their holdings and, and pick out some of the cool stuff that they have is has been really useful for my students. And, and I love it because, you know, Sunday night is now like watch the documentary at the Drew household. It's, it's really fun. Um, That's great. It's back. I remember when I was a kid, my dad and I used to watch Nature, the, the old PBS show. And oh, yeah. I remember uh, he would always laugh at me because you know, I would get so frustrated because for 55 minutes, they would talk about this beautiful ecosystem, the veldt, the Amazonian rainforest. And the last five minutes was like buzz saws and flamethrowers <laughs> and it was all getting chopped down. And I would get so frustrated about the last five minutes. And he jokes about me becoming a conservation biologist because of the influence of that last five minutes of, of nature there repeatedly over it. So I think there's definitely a lot to be said for for this type of program that Curiosity Stream offers because it really does help you um, – convey science to those who aren't necessarily able to go out into the field of engaging stories. And, and unlike some of the stuff that's produced, like you can actually trust the data that come from, from these sources. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one of the reasons why they decided to do some ads with us because they figured our listeners would be interested. And in fact, um, they, they originally contracted for a, a quarter and then they loved the results. So they did it to the end of the year. Oh, congratulations. So we're really, awesome. we're really grateful for that. I hope that, um, you know, they can't go on forever. You, you saturate at some point, but this is perfect. Yeah, right? I mean, good, good connections. So then I, what I was getting onto was this idea that, so not only is your sort of uh, research footprint in this uh, sort of zone of historical ecology, but also you're doing, you know, kind of contemporary ecology as well. And so I thought it would be fun for us to at least take a few minutes to highlight some of the other work you're doing. So it sounds like you're still out on the reef, uh, still making field trips and um, continuing on some of the work that we've already talked about from earlier on in your career in grad school. Yeah, one of the great things about um, our department uh, in Columbia is that as a graduation requirement, we have the students do a senior research, um, uh, do do some, uh, you know, real active research as part of the, what they need to get out. Um, And, 
you know, we had a uh, recognition that asking students to do that sort of research over the summer um, might be a, a hurdle for some students. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we want to make sure that we, we keep diversity in science and that we, we make science accessible to all. And so um, very, very forethoughtfully and, and something I'm really proud of in the department is that we're able to fund all of our seniors to do independent research. So independent of uh, if they need a job at home or, or their, their financial situation, we give them money to go do the work. And I think that's really been instrumental in keeping uh, all different types of students engaged in the scientific process. So from a, a profess- professorial standpoint, that's great, though, because it means we get really, really smart kids who have their own money coming to work with you every summer. Uh, and that is, I mean, what could you could ask for anything more than that? It's, it's fantastic. <laughs> so I keep this active research program going on in Fiji, which keeps me intellectually stimulated, but I use this, um, this research as a scaffold upon which the students can append their own independent research projects. And that's been great because they often come up with really, really interesting projects that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of. Um, and it gives me an opportunity to learn about different systems or just to kind of look at different facets of the same, uh, question that I've been looking at. So it doesn't get stagnant. Mm -hmm. I think that's really Mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've had students look at um, the role of gender in fishing. I think mm-hmm. that's really important. Mm-hmm. Um, Fiji's a um, a fairly gender stratified society, such that I, as a as a foreign man coming in, wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't be really culturally appropriate for me to go hang out with a bunch of women who I'm not related to and ask them about their fishing practices. And um, because of the way it is, most fishery observers are men. And so this whole uh, aspect of women's fishing had largely gone, had been less reported on than male fishing. And so I had a phenomenal student, Abigail Golden, who's now doing her PhD at uh, Rutgers, come in and and talk to the Fiji ladies about what they're catching and talk mm. to, um, try to get, fill in a little bit of the gaps there. So we had a better understanding of what the the tropical marine resources were and how they were being exploited. And I think that's important for conservation because if you only look at half the the resource exploitation, you're you're not going to be very successful. Yeah. Um, so that's been a great one. I had a student, um, Karen Bao, who just graduated last year, who um, it is additionally to graduating with a 4.0 is also a published science fiction writer. So she has <laughs> two novels out um, and the third one's coming out shortly. So she's just one of these amazingly incredible students. Um, and she went and she interviewed uh, people in Fiji uh, in this village of multiple generations uh, about what the the quality of the reef was like. And she was particularly interested in shellfish. And so she asked basically grandma and grandpa how easy it was to get fish, shellfish versus their grandkids. And, you know, the old timers would tell us stories about like you could put the water on to boil, go out and catch fish. And by the time the spaghetti was cooked, you'd have enough clams to mix in with it. Whereas now it takes, you know, over half a day to be able to get the same amount. Wow. And she was looking at um, particular giant clams as a, as a signature species and looking at the, the decrease in size in giant clams over time. And so what we're able to see is again, one of these baselines that has been shifted uh, where younger generations are accepting a duller world as natural. Mm. And that's important because when we accept that, when we acquiesce and accept that duller world as natural, we inadvertently set our bar for conservation too low. Mm. Um, We don't aim for how vibrant it used to be two generations ago. We're like, eh, Mm. good enough. Right. And, and so um, that helps us uh, understanding that shift helps us set biologically realistic goals for conservation and not sell ourselves too short. Yeah. It's a matter of technique. When you're interviewing people, are you there with a pad of paper and you're writing down their responses? Is that how it works? We have a digital voice recorder that we use. Oh, okay. Uh, and then Karen spent a ton of time just transcribing that right. stuff okay. afterwards. Um, and we have often use a translator because although they uh, speak English, it's their second language and yeah. there can be some nuances that may not get translated through. So um, that's a great opportunity to work with um, with people in the village who are interested in doing science. And we've actually, um, not on that paper, but on other papers, we've published with folks from the community because they did work and, and yep. they generated data. So there's no reason not to have them as authors, even though they're not necessarily in academia. So you've had a, um, have had some PhD students already graduate, right? Actually, I'm a lecturer, and so I'm not able to have, don't PhD, have PhD students. students. So I've had I've had master's students graduate, and they've gone. Have some of them gone on to other PhD programs? 
Um, actually, ironically enough, none of my master's students have gone yeah. on to PhDs. I don't know undergraduates if, if I'm scaring them away from, <laughs> from academia. The, uh, reality. Yeah. The, the undergrads have. My master's uh, students um, have gone on to work for NOAA, the, mm. the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric yeah. Administration. Um, another one is a uh, director of research at a biological station in Costa Rica. So they're, they're still sort of in the biz, but they're, um, they're exploring other opportunities. But my undergrads have been a little bit more PhD focused. And so, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're moving along quite well. So what's your next trip? Um, it's a little bit up in the air, but I'm, I'm probably going to go back in Fiji and I'm really interested in flat sharks. Mm -hmm. So flat sharks are <laughs> flat uh, sharks. <laughs> a, a group including sawfishes and guitar fishes, ah. and they're uh, they're incredibly endangered, actually more so than than regular sharks. And I'm interested in working with some folks at uh, the World Wildlife Fund for Nature out there in trying to understand their distribution within Fiji. So it's going to do require a lot of trips around to different villages, trying to figure out if people have seen them and and what sizes mm -hmm. they've been and where mm -hmm. they have. Uh, and the other one that I'm interested in is I have a student working on manta rays in Papua New Guinea. And so I want to go to a manta, manta dive resort in Fiji and look at um, what's called willingness to pay. So right now there are paid services where you can go out and you can snorkel with manta rays and, and it's awesome. Mm. And because it's awesome, lots and lots of people do it. Mm -hmm. And so it's this big morass of boats dumping tourists on top of manta rays and it's it's relatively unregulated and the photos that you get are usually like somebody's fins in front of a manta ray yeah. so it's this big unregulated <laughs> mass and, and people pay a fair amount of money for yeah. it and so yeah. what i'm interested in is um if you were to double the price would you get half the people hmm. would that be a hmm. more sustainable way certainly less stress on the the, yeah. the organism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's trying to do some bioeconomic models to figure out what the optimal amount of money right. to charge cool. is. If, yeah. Do you have you noticed uh, in the years that you've been visiting these sites that the, the reefs have been changing? Yeah, uh, last year Fiji uh, was hit with the second largest cyclone ever recorded in the southern hemisphere, mm -hmm. uh, uh, tropical cyclone uh, Winston, and it really devastated a lot of the the reefs there. And uh, talking to the fishers this year. Uh, we went about two months after the storm hit, and the fish were were really heavily impacted. Uh, a lot of them, ironically enough, they said looked confused because there was so much disturbance on the substrate mm. that their their hidey holes were lost. And so he said you would be able to go out, and there would be these big groupers just kind of wandering around aimlessly trying to look for a place to stay. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, so that was certainly one big impact that we've seen. Um, and the other thing that I've seen is um, – smaller fish ending up in the fish market and slight changes of um, changes of species composition in the fish market. Mm. And Nels, you asked about data that you wish you had. I wish yeah. as a PhD student, I had gone through and sort of wrote down on this day, these were the fish that I saw and these were the numbers because that would be a really valuable data set. But, you know, as a as a first, second year PhD student, I just wasn't thinking about that. I was so focused on the yeah. one thing yeah. I needed to do for my sure. dissertation yeah. that, that those are now data that are lost. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And and also just on the topic of um, coral reefs and bleaching, I mean, this is of course has been a big news topic in the last year, um, linked to, in uh, many ways to climate change and the increase in ocean temperatures, which lagged for many years, but now looks like it's coming up, along with um, acidification as well. There's also been some recent news on that maybe things are a little more robust or recovering. I'm curious to get your sort of expert opinion on this because. <coughs> Um, it, are things really, uh, you know, is this just sort of one small sample or is there really, um, you know, sort of an optimistic view that, that these things could be more sort of resilient than mm. are commonly thought? I think if we continue down the path that we're going now, there isn't much source of optimism. Um, you know, we have, we have definitely stressed these organisms to a tremendous degree. And if we don't take sort of global action to reduce these twin threats of, of increased surface temperatures and, and acidification, a lot of marine ecosystems, not just coral reefs, are, are going to be damaged. And so I'm really heartened that, um, you know, recently we've we've uh, signed the Paris Accord and, and that there is starting to be this movement on climate change. Um, I guess this episode will come out before election day, and I want that to be something that people listening to this in the United States consider when thinking about um, their voting. I don't want to say who to vote for, but it's, <laughs> it's an issue that, that 
could be influenced one way or the other by the polls here. And, and that's one of the things that I want people to realize is that even if you're here in New York City, there are actions that you can take that have global repercussions. So, you know, it really is, is not in somebody else's problem and it's not something that you, I don't want people to feel sort of disenfranchised. There are things that you can do. Yep. So that being said, there are some areas for, for hope. Um, we've identified certain clades of the, um, the, the symbiotic microorganism, um, symbiotidium mitroigaticum, that are bleaching resistant, that have been evolved to survive in warmer temperatures. And that's really, really interesting because, you know, as we know, uh, evolution gives us the, or natural selection acts upon mutations, which gives us the raw material for evolution. And here there is a, a mutation, a different clade that has a, a different selective fitness envelope. And, and that means that we've got a tool that we can use. And whether that's reseeding reefs with this bleaching resistant um, uh, microalgae, if it's uh, transplanting corals from one area to another, um, that's something that we can definitely do. And that's sort of on the geoengineering scheme of mm -hmm. things. Um, but there's other alternatives. Uh, we know that corals can be um, gardened quite well. And there's really, really great work being done in Fiji where people are setting up these coral gardens. And if you kind of get them over uh, a critical threshold, then they can be planted and sort of fill an ecological role. Um, you know, I, I once described it as um, sort of like a back alley fight, you know, that if in a fair fight, a reef is going to be able to deal with climate change, a fair fight, it's going to be able to deal with pollution, with um, mm you know, development, if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, there's enough resiliency built in reefs to be able to, to, for them to stand up to it. But we're putting reefs not in a fair fight. It's a back alley fight where they're getting jumped by six different perturbations at the same time. And that's too much to ask any one system to come hmm. through. But what that means is that if we can attack and, and reduce the damage by one of those perturbations, there is still enough vibrancy. They, these things aren't extinct. You know, we haven't lost them. Their, their numbers are down but they're not gone forever. And so there is still that raw material from which we can work on. And, and you see some of the great work that local communities are doing around the world to be, you know, wise shepherds and, and marshal their resources accordingly. You know, it, that does give me hope that um, there's movement at the geopolitical level and there's also movement at the local level and, and all the areas in between. So, um, you know, I, I often joke that in my sort of dark humor days that my own academic career may outlive that of my study system, um, hmm. which is maybe why I got into historical ecology since I'm looking at <laughs> systems of the past. But um, but I see some of the great work that local communities are doing in, in Fiji um, with their uh, locally marine managed area network, um, where local communities are coming together to come up and address overfishing and address um, unsustainable development practices. That uh, that people are actively acting on it gives me some hope. Yeah. I think we kind of inadvertently here went into sort of the last five minutes of a nature special from years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. Where we just talk about... You I'm can, a buzzkill. No, no, no. It's a, it's okay. really important okay. to talk about. And also, I think, um, to, to address what is going to be the challenge I really see of our lifetimes in some way. And, with, uh, and I think the way you have to consider it is with some grain of hope that we can actually use, start to harness the creativity some of which was on, I think, really nice display in our conversation in the last hour or so. And so, yeah, thank you a lot, Josh. It's really great to, to do this. Absolutely. I've been looking through your website as uh, you've been talking, and uh, a lot of great pictures here. I think it's cool that you entered this contest of, what is it, going to the best field site? Yeah. Some website. <laughs> as Fieldwork face-off. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you have a picture here. It says, at the request of the Fijian government, we conducted a study on the population connectivity of Holothuria. Is that what's in this picture? Is that a Holothuria or is that a sausage? Uh, that is a well-prepared Holothuria. So it's a sea cucumber. Um, oh, okay. And they eat those out. <laughs> that was actually really, um, that was really flattering and really cool. So one of the things we have to do in order to do work in Fiji is, is work with local partners and, and get permission to do work in the country. Yeah. And so- we had been working with them and they knew that I had a background in population genetics and they are trying to manage the sea cucumber fisheries and they didn't have any population genetics. So they were able to, um, they knew that I was coming in and they're like, Hey, Josh, would you mind looking at these sea cucumbers? And, and that's great. I mean, my whole thing is I want to do research that makes a difference. And so when yeah. the, the government of Fiji is coming to me and saying like, we need, this is an, a data gap we've identified. Can you fill it? I was more than happy to be able to go and, and find the money to do that project because that Neat. is, 
you know, that is a direct pipeline into management. Have you eaten these? I haven't. I'm actually a vegetarian, so I was <laughs> so able to avoid these that. These are animals, I guess, yeah. right? Yeah, they're like, um, yep. they're in the same family as starfish. So if you imagine a starfish and then you pull on it so that it, instead of being a disc, it becomes a tube. That's huh. pretty much what you get a sea and, cucumber. And they, they sit on the seafloor? They do. And they're really important because they uh, they eat sand. And they when they eat sand, the sand passes through them and they digest all the microorganisms, the bacterial films, wow. the, the myofauna living within the sand. So they essentially poop out clean sand. It's and so, cool looking. Oh, yeah. We'll have to put the link to yes. Josh's website on there. Also, in this picture, what are these white guys up here in the upper right? Do you know? Sorry, those are our taro. So. Um, a starch that goes along starch? with it. Wow, yeah. interesting. Yeah. And the currency is dollars, right? It looks like uh, Fiji dollars. Yeah. Fiji dollars. Anyway, I I, I, I digress. <laughs> no, that's right. I, I can digress. talk about the natural history of sea cucumbers to the cows come home. That, yeah, that, you like sea cucumbers. Yeah. I mean, they're just so important because they, yeah. when areas where you the sea cucumber populations have decreased, the sand kind of picks up this sort of greenish ah. tinge because it has so many microbial mats in it and, and micro photosynthetic algae in it um but in areas where you do have healthy sea cucumber populations they're they're constantly cleaning that sand so you think about Uh um ecosystem services you think about tourists paying thousands of dollars for white sand beaches um part of that comes by having these healthy sea cucumber populations so you look at it and you're right it looks like a sausage or or maybe after you eat a sausage and wait a couple hours you know it's it's not particularly uh, a charismatic species but then it has this really really important ecosystem role and you know they don't eat most most of them that are not getting eaten in in fiji they're getting marketed and sold um to to other asian markets yeah, and so yeah. there's this globalization and global trade yeah. which we see in shark fins which is also having an impact on sea cucumber populations yeah, i just mm-hmm. looked up sea cucumber genome and came across an article from last summer was sequenced in uh, China because they want to figure out how to cultivate what is a prized delicacy. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, as you think about what you asked about what changes I've seen, I, um, I collected a bunch of these for population genetic studies during my PhD and it was almost trivial to get them because they mm. don't move. Yeah. You yeah, sort right. of sit yep. there and you're like, yeah. yoink, yoink, yoink. <laughs> and so we would collect, you know, 20, that's a good population genetic size, cool. and maybe 10 minutes. And, this paper that I published with my master's student, uh, Aaron Eastwood, who's at NOAA, and Elora, who's in Columbia's lab at Stanford, you know, we had a hard time finding 20 ev- even living there for five or six days. So mm-hmm. even in just the 10 years that I've been in Fiji, we've really seen those populations go down, which is why I'm glad that the government got in touch with me so that we can start um, filling in some of these knowledge gaps. Yep. This episode is also sponsored by Drobo. Drobo makes storage units that you connect to your computer, and uh, they protect your data forever. They're redundant. They're simple to use. I want to tell you a story about how Drobo uh, was founded. The, the man who started the company, he started it because he lost pictures of his honeymoon. Oh, important one. <laughs> they were stored on a RAID system, and the system failed, and uh, he wasn't able to reconstruct it. So he said there has to be something better, and that's where Drobo came from. It's a kind of beyond raid system. They're basically um, little storage units that have multiple drive trays in them. You can put drives in them, and it makes a single volume from any number of drives you put in, and it's redundant. So if one drive fails, You can simply pull it out and put a new drive in and all the data will be restored because they're duplicated over how many drives you have in the array. Uh, And this goes on for as long as you're alive. You know, you can keep your data forever. Uh, And it's very simple. You have a series of lights on the front of the Drobo and when they're green, that means you have plenty of capacity. If they're yellow, you're up to 85%. And then when they're red, you have to uh, get a new drive and you can put a bigger capacity drive in or put a new one in if you haven't filled all the bays. And, of course, uh, if you have one of their 12 drive units, wow, <laughs> you could put 12. What's the biggest hard drive you can get, 4 terabytes these yeah, days? Yeah, something like that. You should know because you're a big data guy, right? Yeah, so. We just we sequence uh, virus genomes, so that's sort of like the um, humble Scandinavian approach to big data is to pick really <laughs> tiny genomes. But we're starting to fill the Drobo that we have in the lab, actually, with vaccinia virus uh, genomes. Yeah. So you got a network attached Drobo that's a, a 5N. Most of the Drobos you plug into your computer and you can 
put your data on them. But this one you plug into a, a router or a switch, and it will be available uh, all across your network, either in the lab or at home, and that's pretty cool. You can access it from multiple points. And uh, Drobo is also encouraging third parties to write apps, and some of those apps allow you to, in a very secure manner, access your data anywhere on the Internet. You can make your own cloud. So you could get your Vaccinia data uh, in um, Fiji if you wanted to. There you so go. If you go visit Josh, you know. There you I go. need to look at my Vaccinia data. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> they make a number of different systems uh, depending on what you need. If you need a little bit of storage or a lot of storage, you know, 8 and 12 drive systems, they also have 5 drive systems as well. I've had a lot of Drobos over the years and they're awesome. Anybody, if you take photographs, your honeymoon pictures, you want them to be safe and secure. Of course, you always need multiple backups. Remember, if you have only on one place, you, the rule is three different backups, right? Two on-site and one off-site. And that's how you protect your data. Uh, micro TV listeners, including Twivo listeners, can save $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo 5D, 5DT, 5N, or any 8 or 12 drive system at drobostore.com. Just use the... Discount code microbe100. We thank Drobo for their support of Twivo. We have a great picture here of Nels's uh, Drobo in action. Yeah, I might have to put the, a link up to that. So we're doing do that, yeah. all of this Oxford nanopore style sequencing, which are these harmonica sized sequencers that yeah. you just plug into your laptop. Look at this, Josh. This is the sequencer right there. Yeah, I have one of those. You yeah, do? I do. Yeah, perfect for field work, right? It is. Yeah. Ah, and you plug it in. This is USB, right? It goes uh, correct, and so it goes to the laptop, and then the data uh, gets sent up to the cloud, the Oxford Nanopores cloud, and then back down. Yeah. And what can happen with the um, with our data sets is our laptops' hard drives fill up so fast that um, having the Drobo to sort of it's cool uh, as a backup system has been really useful. It's a good uh, real world use. All right. Uh, uh, Josh, I know we've kept you here a long time. We're almost done. <laughs> oh, this has been a blast. We have one more thing that we do. Well, usually we do two things, but we're not going to read email today. Uh, we do what we call a science pick of the week. Where, yeah, so where Nels and I pick something that we think is cool in the world of yeah, science. Yeah, and so Josh, we'll do this for a few minutes, and then if you uh, have a pick out there that you're inspired to, feel free to come in here at the end, our guest pick, but uh, don't feel pressure to do that. So... Vincent, my pick of the week this week is a great video that I've been meaning to uh, highlight for a while. This is um, a scientific hero of mine, Mary Claire King, who's up at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. And there's a great YouTube clip of her from the World Science Festival from 2014. It's a um, collaboration with the Moth um, podcast or storytelling um, show. And the title of her uh, contribution to the World Science Festival was, Who Can You Trust?, <laughs> and I don't want to give away the, it's a great story that uh, Mary Claire tells. And so I'm not going to give away any of the, uh, not going to do any spoilers. But what I, what I will say is that her story really puts a exclamation point on work-life balance challenges and science. And she um, goes back to sort of uh, when she was starting her lab and how she was facing some real um, challenges uh, starting her lab and getting things going. Really interesting story with some unexpected twists and turns. So we'll put up the YouTube link. It's worth checking out. So this is from the moth. Correct, yep. This is a, a thing where people get up and tell stories, right? Yeah, exactly. Very similar to Story Collider. Yeah, right? that's Which right. Yep. picked a long time ago. Yep, and they did this one in, in um, collaboration with the World Science Festival. So I think it's nice. on the theme of science and Check out Mary Claire's uh, story. You won't be sorry. All right. Yep. It looks great. All right. My uh, pick is a blog, which um, is over in the, uh, it's in the UK. It's a member of the Center for Virus Research. The grad students and postdocs like to try their hand at science communication. And um, this is called Contagious Thinking. Hmm. It's sponsored by the University of Glasgow, which houses the Center for Virus Research. And, uh, you know, they have different students and postdocs writing from time to time. If someone visits, they'll interview them and they'll have a, a podcast up as well. And so I'd like to give them a little bump. So uh, some of the recent articles, Architectural Antagonism by an Acute Arbovirus, mm. ICP-0 and Skywalker, no, this isn't an episode of Star Wars, <laughs> Innate Immunity Slippery When Wet, Conversation with Richard Hardy, Viruses in the Apiary. So check it out. 
I actually met some of the people who who do the work here oh. uh, when I visited a couple of years ago. Cool. Looks interesting. I learned about this because over on Twiv, we've been having a contest to give away copies of this book, Virus. Oh, yeah. Which I have stacked up here on the desk. Marilyn uh, Rusnik's book. Right? Yeah. So yeah. You, Princeton University Press published it and they asked me if I would give away a, a couple of copies as a promotion. So we've been having little contests. So the first contest, I, I said, okay, if you want to win this book, write 200 words or less which virus you'd like to be and why. <laughs> so we got three responses. <laughs> okay. One of them was really good, so so he won. And then I thought, all right, let's try something else. Halfway through uh, the, the episode of TWIV, I said, okay, if you want a copy of the book, send an email right now with the subject line, I am virus. <laughs> I got 30 responses. uh The first one, within 40 minutes of publishing the episode on a Sunday morning, was by one of these uh, students at the Center for Virus Research. So she told me about this blog, and actually I had met her a couple of years ago when I visited, so check that out. Yeah. By the way, a really cool book by Marilyn, sort of exploring some of the biodiversity of viruses and some, some unusual suspects, I would say, in the viral world. But it's cool that you give people a very low bar thing, just send an email. She said she was in the tissue culture hood listening. And she immediately got her phone and just popped off an email, right? Yeah, there you but go. But if you ask people to write 200 words, they don't want to do it. Yeah. So that reminds me of an <laughs> Easter egg that I had <laughs> hidden in my dissertation. Oh, yeah. Um, I had put in, d- nestled deeply within the material methods. I think it was after I had done the PCR, but before I had done the isopropanol cleanup, I had an email or a, a letter, uh, a sentence there saying that uh, if you send me an email with the ad- with the title Armadillo, I'll buy you a six pack of your choice. <laughs> and I sent that off to my committee members and uh, nobody, nobody? nobody cashed it in. So, my, One of my students, Alan Dove, yeah. on one of my podcasts, had an Easter egg in his uh, materials and methods also. Yeah, I forgot what it was. It wasn't something as clever as that, but it was just some funny sentence that... Uh, <laughs> well, now I shot myself in the foot, though, because obviously I tell my students the story, and now I have to make sure that I meticulously read their material <laughs> yeah, section, right. at least the, the As well as everything the else, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, so I, it was fun when I was 28, but you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm paying for it. Is there and, anything um, you'd like to share with the world? I oh, have gosh. a pick for the science. All right. Um, Very good. So I am uh, very interested in, um, in in diversity in science and, and making sure that we we keep diverse voices in it. So I want to throw um, the the Twivo bump to the Diversify EEB website, which is diversifyeeb.wordpress.com, and this is a list of uh, women and uh, under, uh, scientists who are women in science or underrepresented minorities um, or underrepresented groups in science. Okay. Start that over again. Sure. No All right. More editing for you. All right. So the website is diversifyeeb.wordpress.com. Got it. Uh, and as they say, it's highlighting ecologists and evolutionary biologists who are women and or underrepresented minorities. And I think this is uh, fantastic for people who are interested in doing um, targeted searches for committees, people who are looking to get um, seminar speakers, who are looking uh, for speakers at scientific programs. Um, it's a self-selected list, but uh, it's been a really great service in terms of giving a platform to highlight uh, the, the great diversity of, of scientists that we have. And so that people will say, well, we would definitely get women if they would only, you know, but there aren't any good women to talk about. Well, here's a whole list of uh, really fantastic scientists who have a different background than at least the three of us here. So um, I think yeah. it's important that we recognize diversity in here and, and the folks at, um, at Diversify EB. And there's a, a postdoc and graduate student version of that as well. Um, so if you're looking to diversify your seminar series or just interested to see what kind of um, amazing scientists are out there, then uh, please check that out. I think it's great. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Great. Perfect pick, right? Great guest, great guest pick. Yeah. All right, you can find Twivo at iTunes, microbe.tv slash Twivo. And if you have an iPhone or an Android, you know, there are lots of players that you can use. They're free to download uh, subscribe to the show and listen. And if you do, uh, do us a favor. Even if you don't use iTunes, go over there and rate the show. It helps to give it some stars. You can give it five stars, of course, because it's a five-star show. <laughs> and it brings it up in the Apple lists, and more people will see it and find out how cool a subject uh, evolution has become since the days of Chuck. <laughs> you should also consider supporting all the shows of Microbe TV. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute and we, we have many options. You can use PayPal, a credit card, or Patreon and and support us on a monthly basis. And, of course, as always, we love getting your, your questions. 
and comments, send them to Twevo at microbe.tv. Nels Eldy, you can find him at cellvolution.org. On Twitter, he's L Early Bird. Nice to see you, Nels. Good to see you. Great to be in vivo. I'm going to uh, run out of here and hop a plane back to LD Lab Studios in the Wasatch Mountains in an hour or two <laughs> here, but great to great to check in. And I'll be seeing you in November. Correct. So yeah, we should- Come out be, your way. That's right. We're going to do a uh, another in vivo Tuivo, mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. to celebrate, I would say, our first anniversary actually doing this. So yeah. you'll come to Salt Lake as part of our microbial pathogenesis retreat. And so great. we will highlight some of the interesting Twiv- Twim, Twip, and Twivo related work happening in my neighborhood. All right, looking looking forward to it. Yeah, you and me both. It'll be here before you know it. Time goes by. Coming fast. And actually, next month, stay tuned. I might be doing uh, a field episode and coordinating Mm. with you at the Field Museum. Oh, fantastic. uh, Yeah, so we'll kind of continue our ecology theme. Corey Moreau. Oh, Corey is fantastic. Yeah, that's that's great. Yep, so stay tuned for that one. That should be fun. That'll be fun. Yep. Our guest today has been, has been Josh Drew from Columbia University. Thanks so much. Yeah, guys, this has been a real pleasure. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, it's always fun to chat, and you yeah. can see that it's a lot of fun, right? Absolutely. Uh, do you have a Twitter? I do. What it's is it? uh, uh, Drew underscore lab. Drew underscore lab. And of course, we'll put a link to your website as well so people can look at nice pictures of sharks and uh, sea cucumbers. Sea cucumbers <laughs> and coral reefs. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on Twivo is performed by Trampled by Turtles. You can find their work at trampledbyturtles.com. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Until then, be curious 